Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Suzanne Bargett, and in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to some lesser known paintings of London during the Second World War, which have just been published in this book. The works were part of an official government scheme, and today nearly all of them are in the IWM's art collection. Who do we tend to think of when talking about artists famous for painting the Blitz? Graham Sutherland, perhaps. Here is his 1941 painting, A Fallen Lift Shaft. The bombing of cities during the Second World War produced new and disturbing subject matter. Sutherland later said of this time, Everywhere there was a terrible stench, and always the silence. There was nobody about, just a few police. Very occasionally there would be the crash of a building collapsing of its own volition. Or we may think of Henry Moore, who produced a number of studies of tube shelterers, the Londoners who got what sleep they could each night on the platforms of underground stations. Moore found himself trapped for some hours on the platform of Belsize Park Station and realised that all around him were reclining figures similar to those he had sculpted. Sutherland and Moore are perhaps the best known, but the IWM has works on London by around 40 artists. Most of them little known, but as we shall see, highly capable and determined to show their abilities when documenting how the war had affected the capital. My research brought me into close contact with the fabric of the city. I was able to identify locations which, for reasons of censorship, had not been named at the time. So this is Henry Carr's painting, a railway station in wartime, easily recognisable as St Pancras. Very importantly, I had a wonderful resource at my disposal, for at the IWM we have the correspondence relating to the commissioning of the works by the War Artists Advisory Committee. This was based in the famous wartime Ministry of Information housed in Senate House in Mallet Street, seen here nearing completion in 1937. From within this giant Art Deco building, the committee corresponded with scores of artists and from that effort, a body of work grew, 6,000 works altogether, documenting the war in theatres as far afield as North Africa and Burma. The War Artists Advisory Committee was chaired by Sir Kenneth Clark, later famous for his landmark 1969 television series, Civilization. Clark had been Keeper of Fine Art at the Ashmolean Museum in the early 1930s, and director of the National Gallery since 1934. Flamboyant and energetic, he was in touch with the political elite as well as the art world. Clark cleverly fixed for the output of his scheme to go on show in the National Gallery. The old masters had been sent to Wales for safekeeping, and the National Gallery was gradually filled with the products of the war artist's scheme. First, I'm going to talk about an artist who did not wait to be commissioned but at the very start of the war, eagerly set off across London in search of material. Anthony Gross had already had an eventful life by the time the war broke out. He had lived in France for much of his youth, and as well as painting and etching, had worked on animated films. Gross covered 500 miles on buses in the first few months of the war, making studies such as this one of a terrace in Bethnal Green that has been shored up with sandbags, a common sight across the capital. He seems to have spent a lot of time in Southwark and got access to this rooftop where observers in greatcoats are scanning the horizon for signs of oncoming aircraft. We can see St Paul's and Tower Bridge in the background. The river provided the perfect guide for German pilots seeking a route into the city and hundreds of rooftops were commandeered as lookout points so that their approach could be detected and Londoners warned with air raid sirens. When the Blitz began in September 1940, Gross witnessed scenes like this, fire in a paper warehouse, in which firemen are playing water on the burning rolls of newsprint. Gross wrote of this period, Some days I am perched up among ruins, and the next down in the bowels of the earth with my sketchbook. Anyway, I find that as soon as I get properly going and well into a drawing, I forget all about my surroundings, so an excellent way of forgetting the raids. 
several of the artists served as firemen, joining what was known as the Auxiliary Fire Service. This attracted both artists and writers, including the writer William Sanson, who wrote a highly literary memoir of how Westminster was affected by the Blitz. These firemen artists painted by day the scenes of destruction they had fought the night before. The destruction of the very fabric of London during the Second World War was considerable. Only one house in ten escaped damage, and whole swathes of the city were razed to the ground. It was firemen, more than anyone else, who saw at close hand the extent of this destruction. Reginald Mills was one such fireman artist, and his painting, A Blazing Gas Main in Old Compton Street, shows the devastating effect of a high-explosive bomb landing in Soho. A gas main has caught fire, and a sheet of flame engulfs the street. There was tremendous pride in the fire service, and one gets a sense of this from Ernest Uden, who put plenty of his own professional knowledge into this painting of fire appliances outside Imperial Chemical House on Millbank. In the background, the Houses of the Parliament are on fire. Another painting by Uden, Cannon Street, today lined by modern office blocks, was once home to rows of solid Victorian warehouses. Here we can see it in its pre-war state, St Paul's Cathedral looming in the background as firemen struggle to control the flames with water pumped from the Thames. Once fires were put out, it was vital to keep the hot ashes damped down, so firemen would often spend 15-hour stretches in drenched clothing. Uden also produced this painting of a rather majestic building on Theobald's Road, which has been gutted by fire. Below, fire vehicles have arrived and hoses are strewn across the street. The building was eventually demolished and the plot is now occupied by a modern hotel. If you look up at the double dome of the former Central School of Art nearby, there's a narrow ledge beneath the roof and it must have been here that Uden sat and sketched the dramatic scene below. Paul Dessau was another of the fireman artists, and this painting feels like an elegy to the courage of his fellow firefighters. Dessau gave it the title, And So to Bed. The axe, gas mask, heavy duty boots and helmet remind us of the hazards firemen met each night and how basic firefighting was compared to today. I like the way the artist has included personal possessions in the painting. Socks, tobacco, a towel, snapshots and a letter. A reminder that at the end of his shift, this farmer wanted to wash off the grime and soot and settle down with a letter from a loved one. Leonard Rosalman's painting, A House Collapsing on Two Farmen, has been reproduced perhaps more than any other painting of the Blitz. The scene is Shoe Lane, just off Fleet Street. Rosamon witnessed this terrifying scene himself. One of the two firemen was tragically killed, a fact which haunted Rosamon for the rest of his life. The second fireman was the writer I mentioned earlier, William Sansom. Miraculously, he escaped and went on to write up his experience in a short story, The Wall, which was published in Horizon magazine. Today, Shoe Lane is still a narrow street, but transformed by this giant glass-fronted office block that seems out of proportion for this medieval thoroughfare. The fireman who lost his life, Sidney Holder, is remembered on a plaque. The scale of the destruction of parts of London could not be disguised. Londoners could see for themselves the devastating effects of the bombing. Louisa Puller painted this flattened swathe of the city north of St Paul's Cathedral. We can see the cranes being used to clear the debris, while in the foreground the tiny figures of workmen hack at the ruins, clearing pathways so that the original street layout is restored. The MP and diarist Harold Nicholson suggested that this area be left as an open space after the war. A great space as wide as Trafalgar Square laid low, he wrote. I feel that at any cost we should retain it as a memorial to London's civilians. 
They deserve it, and it gives a magnificent vista of St Paul's, such as Wren would have given his soul to achieve. Destroyed buildings were acceptable subjects, but traumatised people were more problematic. Frances MacDonald was just 26 when Kenneth Clark commissioned her to paint the air raid shelter in the basement of Queen Alexandra's military hospital on Millbank. MacDonald duly visited the hospital, but her visit coincided with an actual air raid. She painted what she saw, and that meant including the terrified expressions on the faces of the patients. Her rendition of the scene, although faithful, alarmed the committee. Frances MacDonald quickly produced this more acceptable version and wrote to Kenneth Clark, apologising for the upset she had caused. Another example, Edward Ardizoni, whom perhaps the authorities thought they could count on to give a cheerful account of the Blitz, in fact produced some very bleak scenes. His watercolours of people sheltering in obvious discomfort produced a peed reaction from the authorities. Here is a letter written by the secretary of the scheme to Kenneth Clark. Malcolm MacDonald, the Minister of Health, who had responsibility for shelters, had seen Ardizoni's paintings and was not happy. In particular, as you can see, he wondered why they were all so depressing. Clark sent the letter back with the short annotation, Thank you, I am rather shocked. So the committee resisted pressure to some degree, but at the same time they had to tread a careful line. Forever under the scrutiny of their parent body, they needed to be careful in what they commissioned and to avoid anything likely to disturb or shock. During the Second World War, the population was drawn into the war effort as never before, and this meant winning hearts and minds. Clark and his committee were quick to see the value of showing ordinary people and their stoicism in the face of all that was happening. Here we have an oil by Ruskin Spear, which he called Seen in an Underground Train, 1943, Workers Returning from a Night Shift. I like this painting as, apart from the wearing of bowler hats, it seems that not much has changed. Commuters still hang on to the overhead straps, reading their morning papers. In the centre are two women war workers, fast asleep, oblivious to the noise and bustle of the train. For Ruskin Spear, who spent most of his life in Hammersmith, the lives of working men and women were a familiar theme. Here, dockers take a break on the forecourt of an enormous depot, queuing for tea at a mobile canteen. These men were vital during the war for ensuring that the country was supplied with food. In the post-war years, of course, the creation of containerised cargo meant that the docks became redundant and the centuries-old workforce went into rapid decline. More dockers now by another artist, Kenneth Roundtree. These men are being treated to a lunchtime piano recital at their canteen on the Isle of Dogs. Roundtree was recording the work of SEMA, the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, which was set up during the war to promote British culture to workers. It was a move typical of the time and one with lasting impact, as SEMA later became the Arts Council of Great Britain. Another vast workforce was the nursing profession, working both to deal with army casualties who came back from France following Dunkirk, or RAF men burned during the Battle of Britain, and of course those in injured in the capital as a result of the bombing. This is a first aid station at St Mary's Paddington, painted by Anna Zinkeisen, who also worked there as a medical artist. Here, Evelyn Dunbar, perhaps the best known of the women artists, gives us an insight into the lives of the nurses working for the emergency evacuation service. This was set up to transport casualties out of the capital for treatment so that inner London hospitals would not be overwhelmed. The staff are off duty, but in a few hours will be ready for the nightly dash down the railway tracks into the city to retrieve the injured. At 22, Mabel Hutchinson was the youngest of the artists to contribute to the scheme. She had been about to start at the Slade School of Art when the war broke out, and so instead she volunteered to work for the Rest Centre Service in Bermondsey. The anguish of the small boy at the centre of this painting can only be guessed at, as he explains his situation to the supervising nurse, 
towering above him in her starched uniform. The suddenness and the scale of the blitz on London took the government by surprise. We know that an appeal for staff for the rest centres drew offers from many teachers and social workers who, seeing the seriousness of the situation, raided schools and removed what was needed, cutlery, crockery and food. Thankfully, within weeks, the government moved in with immense orders for blankets, mattresses, camp beds and bunks. Bernard Hailston made a number of portraits of Londoners engaged in war work, and this is his portrait of Christian Vlasto, one of the young women who volunteered to help run the supply boats on the Grand Union Canal, which hauled 50-ton cargoes of coal, steel and cement between London, Birmingham and Coventry. Vlasto was an accomplished artist in her own right and also a gifted writer. After the war, she married the Pakistani author Ghulam Abbas, and moved to Pakistan. In the course of my research, I was delighted to receive from Vlasto's daughter in Karachi an unpublished memoir by her mother in which she described the war years and what it had been like to navigate along the Regent's Canal into the bomb-stricken East End. Vlasto also wrote of the impact of the start of the V1 flying bomb attacks. As we returned from up country, she wrote, we observed the grim yellow faces and peevish temper of the Londoners. Their lives were a living hell. The committee weighed up the risk of allowing some secret locations to be recorded and judged that it was worth it. Here we have a group portrait by Meredith Frampton showing the civil servants Sir Ernest Gowers who oversaw London's regional civil defence with two colleagues in their secret control room a semi-basement that sat between the geology and the natural history museums. Gowers is best known today for his guide to English grammar, plain words, but back in 1940 he was responsible for London's defence against the bombing. It fell to him to brief MPs on the scale of losses in London in the first four months of the Blitz. He had to report that over 14,000 Londoners had been killed. One can sense the weight of responsibility on his shoulders, but also see that he is supported by two capable looking colleagues. The basement of Broadcasting House in Portland Place was a rather unexpected commission for Frank Dobson, better known for his sculpture than his painting. It was Audrey Russell, the BBC's first female commentator, who wrote to the committee, pointing out the omission of radio from the topics she had seen at the National Gallery exhibitions. The emergency control room was at the deepest level and housed the BBC's vital transmission equipment. Dobson must have spotted the unusual perspective that could be got from the balcony which ran round the room at mezzanine level. We can imagine him at work while below technicians are busy ensuring that the broadcasts go out on schedule. This painting, also by Frank Dobson, shows an aspect of London Underground's history which even today is not well known. These women are on their way down to a secret underground factory that operated along a newly completed five mile extension of the central line. Most companies moved their factories out of London, but Plessy, the company which supplied the RAF with aircraft parts and radios, was allowed to install a factory in this unusual setting. It could be accessed from three stations, Wanstead, Redbridge, and Gantz Hill. Most secret of all, of course, were the invasion plans for D-Day and the construction of the Mulberry Harbours in the London docks was a part of the plan. These were the huge floating concrete harbours that were towed across to France to allow equipment to be transported and rapidly offloaded onto the invasion beaches in June 1944. The etcher and watercolourist Muirhead Bone spent a lengthy period in the docks, in this instance the Surrey docks where he painted this vast phoenix caisson under construction. The dock has been drained and huge quantities of blitz rubble and concrete are being used to build the caisson. You can see from the tiny size of the workers the immense scale of these construction sites. Francis MacDonald also painted the Mulberry Harbours, spending three months at the docks, where the authorities built her a small studio on the quayside. From there she saw the whole operation at close hand, 
including the fact that workers' lives were lost in the process. She later recalled in an interview the pathetic little collections for their relatives at the gate. She also remembered that three of the concrete harbours got stuck to the bottom of the dock and did not float up as intended, prompting furious reactions by those in charge. MacDonald's was sworn to secrecy over what she was painting, but in an astonishing breach of the rules, she was allowed to take home some engineering plans of the harbours. An official thought they would help ensure her painting was accurate. But MacDonald's husband was also working on secret operations, and his reaction on finding the plans in their Chelsea flat may well be imagined. This scene, also by MacDonald, has at its centre what was known as the New Admiralty Building, a heavily fortified centre for naval intelligence just a short walk from Trafalgar Square. It is still there today, a brooding unmarked building covered in ivy. The building had foundations nine metres deep and a six metre thick concrete roof and gun emplacements ready to deal with an attack on the heart of government. To get a good perspective on her subject, MacDonald was given access to the roof of a large house in Carlton House Terrace. When she arrived there with her easel and paints, she realised that the building was the former German embassy, which had been locked up at the start of the war and now had a decidedly eerie quality. She was led into its enormous banqueting room, where a dinner table lay untouched since the rapid departure of its staff at the start of the war. This painting by Leila Faithful is one of my favourites, I think because it is such a gentle, sympathetic treatment of a special moment in the war. It is the 8th of May 1945, VE Day, and crowds are gathered in front of Buckingham Palace. In the distance, we can just make out the figures of Churchill and the royal family on the balcony. The focus here, though, is on the ordinary people, the parents helping children and the husbands helping wives to get a sight of the historic moment. For the thousands of Londoners who streamed into the National Gallery, and for those in provincial galleries who saw the paintings on tour, the works served a special purpose. They showed the capital in defiant mode and reminded the viewers that this was their war, the people's war. The less obvious was brought to the fore, fittingly as it was the everyday that kept the city grinding on through the darkest days in its history. Not only were Londoners given the opportunity to see an extraordinary body of work that told the story of their city's survival, but the war they depicted was one they could recognise. 